Okay, so it's five past, five past five, Canary Island time. Um, I think uh, it's time to start. So first of all, uh, thank you all for being here this afternoon and joining us to, to know a bit more about Angel Sharks. Um, thank you for being here. There's a couple of rules we would like you to follow during this, um, this talk, okay? And so the first one is, uh, please keep your mics mute, okay, your microphones, so there's no background interference while the talk is going on. If you do have questions during the talk, okay, feel free to write them down on the chat. You just have to open the chat up, write down your question, okay, and then my colleagues are here as well. They will answer some questions as we go on. And at the end of the talk, we will also have a question and answer uh, moment where we can answer and uh, these questions more deeply. And by the way, this talk is being recorded, okay? Um, and our intention is to upload this talk on YouTube afterwards. If someone has any issue, okay, about us putting this uh, YouTube video public, uh, please let us know and we can do something about that okay so if there's no questions to start with well let me start so my name is mike okay mike Rossili. um i am project officer of the angel shark project canary islands okay i am a marine biologist and i've been in this project for quite a few years now um with the rest of my colleagues so this afternoon, what we're gonna do is we're gonna be talking about this mysterious angel shark, and I hope um, all you get to know more about our beloved angel shark as we do. So to start off, okay, the angel shark project, um, Canary Islands, this is the project um, I belong to, okay. Our aim in the Canary Islands is to secure the future, this critically endangered angel shark in its unique stronghold that is here in the Canary Islands. Now, this is just part of a bigger project, okay, the Angel Shark Project, that is to ensure the conservation, okay, and the future of this critical shark, but out through its original um, distribution, okay. So down here, we have the Angel Shark Canary Island team, okay, and yeah, so a couple of my colleagues are here with me also, and we'll be helping out during this talk. So let's start off with what is an angel shark, okay? We're gonna start off with angel sharks in general, because as we will talk about, okay, angel shark is not one species, okay? So let's start with what is an angel shark exactly? Now here we have a classification, okay, where we can see the, the different levels of classification where we can find the angel shark included. So obviously uh, the angel shark is an animal, okay, it's in the animal kingdom. Um, it's a chordata, okay, um, it has a spinal cord, okay, it's a vertebrate, it has verte vertebrates. It's in the Gnathostomata okay, group that includes all the fish that have jaws. Okay? And inside the fish, in the Pistis superclass, okay, it's in the chondrichthines. Okay? So here we have another slide where we can see the, uh, the different groups that are inside okay, this big fish group, okay, the Pistis. So on one side, we have the Actinopterygii. Okay, Actinopterygii, that would be the bony fish. Those fish, okay, that have um, bones and they also have gills covered by an operculum. While we have another group, okay, um, that are the chondrichthys, where we would include the sharks, okay, plus other groups. And here we will find all of the fish that have cartilaginous bones, okay? They would be inside this group, or cartilaginous skeletons, better said. Inside the chondrichthys and these fish with cartil cartilaginous skeletons, we have the holothephaly that includes the commonly known uh, chimera, okay? Very mysterious uh, looking animals that usually live quite deep. 
And then we have um, the elastomer branching group, group where we have on one side the battery there. Okay, this group of the battery there they include all uh, the skates, rays, mantas, torpedo rays. Okay, they would all be included in this group here. While if we go to the other direction, we find the Selashi group, okay, that would include all of the mm, sharks, okay, um, that are not these uh, flat cartilaginous uh, fish, these flat conjunctives. Inside the Selashi group, we find the Galeomorphi, okay, sharks, this group here, that would include the modern sharks, as to say, okay. Um, the modern group of sharks and the most typical sharks we can imagine are included in that group, okay, the Galeomorphi. While in the subgroup, group, the Squanomorphi would be like an older group of sharks, more primitive group of sharks. And in this group, we would find our beloved angel shark, okay, they would be here among the Squanomorphi, okay, in a family called the Squatiniforms, okay. So this is our tree, and if we look at it, because some people um, confuse angel sharks with rays, okay, and by the look of them, you would think that, yeah, they could be included in a, in a similar group, okay, but in fact, they're like um, quite far cousins, okay, and we'll see why in a moment. So here rays, and here are angel sharks. So let's go with some of the differences, okay, between um, angel sharks and the battery there group, okay. So here this, you've all probably been to an aquarium and seen this, this image of the skates and rays swimming around or uh, against the, the glass windows, okay. And you get this image, okay, it looks quite cute. Um, so using these images here, I'm going to tell you the difference and why angel sharks are sharks and not rays, okay? So the first characteristic is what I'm showing now with the arrow of my mouse cursor. I hope you can see it. Um, wait, let's go back. Okay, so let's have a look at the position of the mouth, okay? The mouth of skates and rays, okay, this would be um, a cow nose ray, okay. The position of the mouth is ventral. The mouth is under the body of the animal, okay. And we will see that in all the Batsuidea group. While if we look at the angel sharks, okay, and the rest of the sharks, we will see that the mouth has a terminal position. It's right at the front, okay, of the animal. We can see it in these two images, okay. By the way, we'll be seeing lots of drawings like this, a lot of illustrations there from Mark Dando, okay, with really nice illustrations of English sharks that we'll be seeing during this talk. So yeah, the mouth, that's uh, the first clue to know um, that angel sharks are not in the ray group, okay, they're in the shark group because their mouth has a frontal position. Second, okay, characteristic, okay, that showed us, shows us that angel sharks are in fact sharks, is the position of their gins, okay. If we have a look at these two rays, okay, we see that the gills are also in a ventral position, they're under the body of the animals, okay, totally under. While in the angel shark, we see that the gills are here at the side, and even though some part of the gills, okay, are underneath, okay, the gills will actually come over, okay, in a more lateral position, okay, than in the rays that are totally ventral. So those are one of the two, okay, big um, evidences, okay, and the big characteristics that tell us that um, angel sharks are in fact sharks, okay, even though they are pretty similar to um, skates and rays, okay, because of their flat shape. They're not the typical shark, okay, that we see in the movies. So, um, why their shape is so similar to those of skates and rays is something we call convergent evolution, okay? Convergent evolution is something we see in animals that 
share the same habitat, the same lifestyle, okay? And that, well, they develop similar characteristics in their bodies, okay? A similar morphology be, to adapt to those conditions to that habitat in which they live in, okay? So it's just what's in science we call convergence evolution. But not for that reason does it mean that they've got to be in the same group, okay? Here we can see in an image um, we took a couple of campaigns ago. Here we can see one of these angel sharks okay, buried in the sand. Um, and as you can see, the camouflage is great. And we'll see uh, a video later on um, and talk more about how angel sharks bury themselves in the sand. Because they spend most of their life okay, buried in the sand. That is also very like. Um, the lifestyle of rays and skates. So when we talk about angel sharks, okay, we're talking about a lot of sharks, okay, in general. And um, here, okay, this information was taken out of um, a really nice study, okay, done in 2009. And these scientists want to group angel sharks depending on um, their, their uh, resemblance, okay, on um, having a look at their genes, okay, and they were trying to group them to see um, who had common ancestors. And the thing is that in this family of sharks, okay, there's only actually one common ancestor. And from this one common ancestor, we have all these 25 species of angel sharks, okay, and out of these 25 species of angel sharks, okay, um, these scientists managed to group up these one, two, three, four, five groups, okay, where they could introduce or they could group up, okay, angel sharks that had more resemblance, okay, or their DNA, their genes had more resemblance. So when we have a look at these groups, okay, we can find, first of all, we have this Europe, North Africa, Asia group, okay, where we have these species here, okay, Squatina stands for the genus okay, of the animal, okay, in classification, and the last um, words in the aguleada, squatina, squatina, oculata, these words are a specific name of each species, okay, that's why you would see squatina in every row, okay, because that is the common genus, they're all included in the genus, squatina, squatina. So we have this top group, okay, Europe, North Africa, and Asia, okay, we have quite a lot of angel sharks here, included. Now you might think that um, this is weird to group angel sharks um, from Asia and Europe all together, um, but as um, we I said before, they all come from a common ancestor. And remember, these sharks have been around for hundreds of millions of years, okay? So the oceans have been moving around, and so some of these sharks might have been um, connected, okay, in another time. Um, then we have South Africa, okay, we have this single species in South Africa, okay, um, all on its own. Then we have in Australia, we have four, four species around Australia, okay, a bit isolated. In America, okay, including North and South and Central America, we have these five species. And then we have this other group, okay, that isn't specified, uh, the region isn't specified, because they are angel sharks that um, have had very small um, uh, citations, there's been very small registrations of these angel sharks, okay, some species have only been found in like fish markets and things like this, so there isn't much knowledge about them, so they haven't been included in any of the other groups. Okay, um, also some of these angel sharks were discovered actually after this study was done. Um, like um, these ones here at the bottom, okay, Scottinavari, David, Alieti, we'll see some images of them in a moment, okay. Um, so yeah, there's still angel sharks being discovered in the, in the last years, okay, that's something quite interesting. So let's have a look at them. Um, these are the ones we can find in around Europe um, and Asia and North Africa. 
Now, angel sharks, as you will see, they're actually very similar one from another, okay? They're actually very similar. Morphology of the body, okay, is very, very similar. There are small things that help us differentiate each species, um, but it's not easy, okay? You've got to get very familiar with the, with the species to actually recognize them at first sight. And even then, sometimes you need to really look at small details to recognize the exact species. But some of the things we can use to differentiate species are, for example, the barbels, okay? They have little barbels at the front uh, that help to detect vibrations in the water. Um, the distribution and the shape of these barbels is one of the characteristics that can help differentiate species also, there are some markings that are exclusive to some species. Okay, here we can see these dots. Um, let's have a look here. Here we have some more Spotina africana. This is the lonely one down at the bottom of Africa. As you can see, the head is another characteristic that's also used to differentiate species. Um, some of the heads are rounder. Uh, they have small bumps on the top of their head. Some heads have a more triangular shape, okay? Um, then some of them, well, as I said, as we saw before, okay, these ones have these dots that are exclusive of this species, or here we have also some dots on this Platina tegocelata. Here we have the ones we find around America. Okay, the armata, this one, for example, we have these bumps on the top of the head. It's quite characteristic to them. And then we can also find in angel sharks, even though we can't see it in these photos, but many of them present on the back um, a line of tiny little spines. And the distribution of those spines that okay, can help differentiate some species. Um, here we find some of these weird species, okay, that aren't classified in any of the other regions we saw before. Okay, there's this one, the Galieti one of the Philippines, it's very round. And I think this one, there's only been like five uh, registrations of this shark. So it's a very unknown shark. And there's still so much to learn from them. These sharks spend a lot of the time buried in the sand. Um, lots of times um, the fishing methods of the area doesn't catch these sharks. And so we really know very, very little about them. We have in the recent years, 2016, we had this Swatina David, okay, was um, described. 2016, that was only four years ago. Okay, and then we had the Spatina Rari 2018, okay, in Brazil. It just shows us how little we know about our ocean still. And because these are quite big, I mean, they're not small, tiny sharks, okay, they're, they're actually quite big. So it's hard to believe with all what we've explored about the ocean, all the divers in the ocean, all the fishing that's been going around, okay, in the past decades that we are still finding. Um, new species. Okay, that's quite astonishing. So from now on, okay, we're going to start talking more specifically about the Squatina Squatina. Okay, this is the angel shark. Okay, we are working on here in the Canary Islands. Okay, the Squatina Squatina. But in general, the Squatini die uh, family. Okay, um, Nick Dalby in 2014. Let's remember. Um, he did the study and uh, pointed out that the angel shark, okay, the Squatini dive group, is the second most threatened family of elasmobranchs in the world. Okay, so we're talking about um, a group of animals. Okay, that is there is less, very little known about them, but at the same time they're very threatened. Okay, the IUCN. Okay the International Union for the Conservation of Nature, okay, in their red list, they classified it as critically endangered, okay. Now, because of the decline of their populations, mainly due to overfishing and habitat destruction, okay, um, due to these declines, okay, the European um, Union 
bans commercial fishing back in 2009, okay, to try and reduce the mortality, okay, and the extinction of these species. And just last year, okay, finally, after lots of work of a lot of people, okay, they finally included um, angel sharks in Spain under the National Catalogue of Endangered Species. But not only did they classify it in the catalogue, but they also gave them the maximum protection. Okay, and that means that not only the angel sharks are protected, but their habitat is protected about against any sorts of perturbation. Okay? So this is was really good news that we celebrated loads last year. Okay? It was a huge success. So. Under this law, it's known as Squatina squatina, okay, that was protected uh, by the two other species, Aculeata and Ogulata, that all, are also found in the Mediterranean species, are also protected under this Spanish law. Okay, so that's great news. And for you guys to have an idea of how protected angel sharks are at the moment, okay, they have the same level of of protection as the Iberian lynx, okay? This lynx that everyone knows about in Spain and is an icon in Spain for conservation. Well, they're in the same group, okay, in this national catalog. They have the same level of protection. Now, with this level of protection and knowing how special angel sharks are, we consider that they should be an icon for the Canary Islands, especially where we have uh, a quite a good population, okay, we have the uni a unique stronghold of angel sharks here. So they should be an icon uh, for the islands, just as, for example, the vieja, okay, the small parrotfish is an icon, or even the, the famous platano de Canarias, the Canarian banana known all around. Well, that's one of our aims also is to do outreach and make sure that angel sharks get the recognition they deserve. So why the Canary Islands? Okay, let's have a look. So in this map here, we can see, okay, uh, some of the distribution of this species, Squatina squatina, um, around Europe. So here we can see in different colors of uh, purple, we can see, first of all, the former range, okay, in the lighter purple. So this is where the angel shark, the Squatina squatina, used to live, okay, and there's been uh, registrations, all registra registra registrations, and we know it did occupy, okay, all the north, okay, all around Spain, down here, the coast of Africa, okay, most um, the, uh, of the coast of Europe, okay, and even the Black Sea. But sadly, okay, their population started to decline, mainly because of overfishing. Um, let's remember that angel sharks spend most of their time buried under the sand. So there's a fishing method that, um, that they cannot escape, that is trawler fishing. Okay, these huge fishing boats that carry what well, they drag these huge nets along the bottom, scooping up all the organisms okay that they find in their way. Angel sharks sleeping on the in the beds, okay, in the sand or muddy areas, okay. They think that there they're hiding, okay, they would not move. And once the net went over them, okay, they would launch out trying to escape, but it would be too late. So trawler fishing has happened and has been used in most Europe for decades now, okay? So that is one of the main reasons why the angel shark has disappeared in its former range. In a darker purple, okay, we have a recent known distribution, okay? This means that there have been sightings in these places since the year 2000, okay? Now that doesn't mean there's been loads of sightings in this area and people have seen loads of individuals, okay? This means that, hey, there's been one, two sightings, maybe a fisherman caught one and reported it, maybe uh, someone found one in a fish market, okay? There's been small reports, okay, um, 
uh, or registrations of angel sharps in these locations. Okay. But here in the Canary Islands, okay, one of its original um, ranges, okay, here we've been super lucky that not only do we have great habitats for the angel sharks that we'll see in a moment, okay, but trawler fishing has not really happened here, okay, there has been no trawler fishing here. So that fishing that is so lethal to angel sharks, okay, here hasn't happened so the population of angel sharks has managed to maintain itself more or less okay or at least we have a population of angel sharks and it's quite frequent to see them here during our dives so that is excellent for us in the angel sharks and it gives us a unique opportunity to know more about this species and hopefully okay in the future help out to recover the angel shark in its original distribution. So when we start working on, on any species, and in this case, the angel shark, okay, one of the most important things is to know where it lives, when does it live, where does it go to, to know more about its biology and ecology. We need to know its movements, what it eats, how much it grows, where does it spend each moment of its life. All this data is super important. It's data that takes a long time to collect. Okay, so it's, it's an ongoing um, project and it will take a long time to get solid data. But we already have okay, a publication from 2016. Okay, this publication is from the Angel Shark Project that brought up some initial data okay that is super interesting now most of this data comes from divers okay from recreational divers that reported their sightings and thanks to them we gathered loads of information to, to start with and information good enough for this publication so one of the first things okay uh, was to find suitable habitats, habitats where angel sharks would um, frequent more than others. We see that we have this orange color, orange tending to red color, that would be the most suitable habitat, while um, the ones in blue would be non-suitable. Okay? And this is all um, being carried out, okay? we're analyzing the data and the frequency of sightings. It doesn't mean that maybe in La Gomera, El Hierro, or La Palma, there's no suitable habitat. It just means that there's been less registrations, okay, or less sightings of angel sharks uploaded, um, or less data from those islands. But in the future, with more data, okay, we will be able to uh, specify more um, suitable habitat for the species. These circles, indicates the frequency of the sightings and registrations of angel sharks. So we can see here in Gran Canaria, okay, we have some hot spots, same as here, Lanzarote, Gran Canaria, and Tenerife, we have some hot spots where we have a huge frequency of angel sharks. Here in Tenerife, okay, um, it actually, this hot spot actually belongs to the biggest nursery area of angel sharks known um, and that is the Teresitas Beach that many of you might know of. Um, and in Lanzarote, we have here a very famous place for divers, for scuba divers. And that also helps um, to have loads of registrations in one point. You've got loads of divers going there and reporting their sightings. Okay. So as I said, this project is, is a marathon. You've got to keep on collecting data to um, make all these maps okay more accurate and more specific so first of all we need to find as i said suitable habitat and then also another important thing is to understand where the angel shark um, lives in the different stages of its life okay in this bottom graph also extracted from this study we can see that um, in the dark line here this would be um, baby sharks, okay, newly born sharks. 
And here on the x-axis, we have the depth ranges, 0, 5, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20, and so on. And these in the y-axis would be the number of sightings. So we see that newborn angel sharks are most frequent in 0 to 5 meters depth. Okay, and then their numbers go down, or the sightings at least go down as the depth goes down. On the other hand, okay, between 15 and 10 meters, we have a big abundance of juvenile, okay, that would be these dotty lines here, and also um, adult sharks. And then we have here another one that's unknown, okay, that we don't know about them. And they haven't got information about these sighted sharks. So it's normal to think that um, baby sharks will not share the same habitat as the adults, okay? Um, basically because they eat different things, they need um, different foods. And usually wild animals, the babies and the adults don't mix together because the babies could end up being food of the adults also. So we often see that um, the babies always spend their, their, their time in different places, in different habitats than the adults. And this graph shows that. Now we have a, lot, a lack of data down here in the big depth, but that is because divers, recreational divers, can only go down, okay, legally to 40 meters beyond those depths, okay? It's very strange for a, a recreational diver to go down that deep. So this is where we'll need um, other ways to find angel sharks that I'll talk about later on. Okay, also there is a distribution among the year, okay, there's like a seasonal distribution of the angel sharks. Um, and we can see that here in this graph, okay, when we analyze the data here, we can see that from April, July, okay, most of the sightings belong to juvenile angel sharks, newborn angel sharks, and females. Okay. Now, our hypothesis is that this is because the females are turning up, they're coming close to the shore to give birth to the pups, to the baby angel sharks, that will spend their first year, more or less, okay, in the shallows where they're protected and they have an abundance of. Uh, foods, okay, of small fish and stuff. So April and July, okay, we mostly see females and babies. While later on, okay, uh, between December and February, what we see is mostly females, but also males, okay, and this is um, what we think because it's mating season, okay. So the mating season, obviously, females and males will both come to the shallows, okay? They will aggregate and they will mate um, during those seasons, in those months of the year. And it's usually always um, in the coldest months. So when we say December, February, it depends on the islands a bit as well. Each of the Canary Islands has its own uh, characteristics. And we can see that the, the spatial distribution, okay, and the, uh, the seasonal distribution, sorry, um, of the angel sharks varies a little bit among the different islands. Let's talk a little bit more about the biology of the angel sharks. Um, we said that they spend most of their time buried in the sands, and that is where they will wait for their prey. Okay, here we have again these Mark Dander illustrations. The angel shark is buried in the sand. And when it sees, okay, or detects a suitable prey above him, okay, or her, they will jump out, leap out of the sands and ambush the prey and basically suck it inside, okay, like a vacuum. It's like, and it's super, super fast, okay. I think we have a video at the end. Um, if not, I'll send you a link where you can see it. But it's a super fast attack um, where they attack the prey and the jaw. Of the shark basically comes out of the head. Okay, it's an, it's an amazing, um, amazing view to watch. Um, 
here we're going to go to instagram okay to have a look at a video from alexander of canos de fuego it's a dive center in lanzarote that help us a lot and here we're going to see the sequence of an angel shark burying itself Okay, that was it. It's quite amazing uh, when you see them, and it's strange, but they all have the all the individuals. They have the same sequence of um, of movements um, when they're going to bury themselves. They like do this a couple of times, and just before burying themselves completely, they put their pectoral fins up, like really stretching out like this, and suddenly boom, they do this big like bounce on the bottom. And that's like the last movement they do. And we've seen that that sequence of movements um, to bury themselves is repeated um, and is done in both juveniles, newborns, and adults. Okay, so it's like an instinct uh, movement they have. Um, here, okay, just for you to have a look, this video is from Especies de Canarias, Felipe Rabina, um, who also helps us. As um, Lowe's, he's one of our collaborators, and here you can see an angel shark yawning. This is a very weird uh, thing to see, okay? It's not very common. I've seen it once or twice. Um. So it's an impressive view, okay, to see the, the angel shark yawning. And it's a great image for us to see the barbels, okay, of the angel shark that we, I told you before. They use these barbels to detect vibrations in the water. And when it opens its mouth, we can see that inside it's got the rows of teeth, okay, this small spiky teeth, okay. And like all sharks, they have many rows of teeth that um, fall out, but as soon as... I, some teeth fall out there's other teeth waiting just behind to go into their place so sharks can go through hundreds of teeth during their life okay so this is a great image here and their prey probably this is like because it's only yawning it's like in slow motion but when they ambush their prey to hunt it's done in less than a second it's, it's amazing so let's get back to the presentation um let's see ah, here we are. um i don't know why this slide hasn't um i forgot to translate it sorry about that i think the next one will be translated so um Angel sharks have um, sexual dimorphism, okay? We can see a difference between males and females, even though that difference is not very obvious, okay? So the main difference between males and females, okay, are these claspers or pseudopenises, okay, we can call them. Now, the cartilaginous fish are the only fish that have internal fertilization okay for their reproduction okay internal fertilization when sperm and egg cells will connect okay will be fertilized inside the mother and obviously to be able to do that okay there need to be mating organs there need to be um sexual organs so in this case the male has these two scientifically known as claspers these two pseudo penises they're not, are not really penises, okay? In fact, what they are is um, you see this fin going around here, okay? Well, as they develop this fin, okay, the skin of the fin starts to uh, grow and like um, twist, okay? Forming these claspers, okay, like long tubes where the semen will be sent out during the mating process. 
And they have two because we have two fins. So one will develop on each fin. Okay. And for them, it's quite useful because depending on um, where they get the female, okay, it's mates, they will use one or the other for the mating process. Here we have a female. The female, when she's swimming, um, you don't see these claspers, okay, and the males, they're pretty obvious. And the females tend to be a bit bigger, okay, and a bit wider. Yeah, that's the same for most cartilaginous fish, the females tend to be bigger than the males. Um, the average size for angel sharks is uh, one meter 50, okay. Even though, though in the Canary Islands, okay, the ones we've seen are mostly a bit smaller, okay. It's not very frequent to see 150 centimeter sharks here. Um, the biggest female registered was two meters 44 centimeters. Two meters 44 centimeters. That is a big angel shark, okay. I'd love to see an angel shark that big. But that was in 1984, okay. It's a long time ago. Um, as I said, they have the males and females, okay. We can distinguish them by these claspers. Even though when they are buried in the sand, okay, sometimes it can be a bit hard to see these claspers, okay, so it's not always easy. And even though we might feel tempted when diving to have a look at those claspers, see if it's male or female, we shouldn't be annoying them because that would make them lose energy by having to swim to another place that might not be as suitable for hunting. Here we can see those claspers. Okay, so the mating, okay, um, is quite interesting. Here, this is another sequence, okay, from a video from Especies de Canarias, Felipe Ravina. Uh, this was in the south of Fuerteventura, and it was during a night dive. And basically what happens is the female is waiting, okay, in the shallows. The males are swimming around. And when the female detects that the male is nearby or close, we've seen that they, uh, they lift their tail up, okay? They arch their tail and their back up. And it seems like an indication telling the male that they are receptive, okay? That they are ready to mate. But that seems, okay, that, that's it, okay? But it's not that simple. The male then has to bite her, okay? Obviously, they don't have hands, okay, and they live in the water, so mating isn't that easy. So the male, in order to keep her still, okay, or to grab her, to be able to mate, he needs to bite her pectoral fin. Now, he either does it in the exact right place, or the mating will be failed, okay? The act of mating will not happen, because after grabbing the female by the pectoral fin, they will do this tornado dance okay um, on the bottom and the male will manage to get one of his claspers inside the cloaca of the female it's very quick okay it doesn't last more than a minute usually okay and once that happens they both swim off but those people that have reported or seen a mate uh, two angel sharks mating are really really lucky because there's loads of failed attempts the males have not bitten her in the right place, okay, or they just don't, can't find where to bite, okay, and the mating process just gets aborted, okay, and, and nothing happens. So it's not that easy for them. During mating season, it's quite common to find uh, females, okay, that have these scars on her pectoral fins. Um, we could call them love bites. So the, the little scars they have here, okay, and this has just been because she's been mating the males and the males have been biting them there on their spectral fins. Now, don't worry, um, this is very common in sharks. Sharks, uh, male sharks often bite the females um, to, to grab them for mating. And even though it seems a bit violent, sharks have an amazing ability to cure themselves and to heal from these wounds. So even though they get these love bites, okay, during mating, the females will be recovered in no time at all. 
Okay, the skin is really hard and thick here. And in no time at all, you won't even be able to see this. So let's talk a little bit more um, about the type of reproduction they have. Okay, so inside um, the chondrichthys, okay, in the cartilaginous fish, we find three ways of, um, of uh, development, okay, inside the uterus. Well, not always in the uterus, sorry. So you find three ways of development, oviparous, oviviparous, and placentary viviparity. Those are the three, okay, ways that baby sharks can be developed. Um, oviparous would be um, like older sharks usually use this way, okay, where we have, just like birds, we have an egg, and inside the egg, okay, we have a little baby shark, okay, with a big yolk sac, okay, that contains all the nutrients that this baby shark needs to develop. By the time the shark absorbs all these nutrients from this egg, it will be ready to come out of the egg, okay, and swim, swim away. It will be a fully formed shark. It's a bit risky um, for sharks to use this strategy for, for reproducing because obviously the female leaves these eggs usually hidden among algae or coral or among rocks. And obviously these um, eggs can be um, washed away or eaten by other animals. Um, so it's a bit risky and usually sharks that use this way are sharks that reproduce quite frequently, okay? at least more than other sharks. Then we have oviviparous, okay? So these are sharks that there is an egg, okay? They're developing it inside the egg, but that egg stays inside the mother, okay? So the shark is developing inside an egg, inside the mother, okay? Until it is ready um, uh, to come out of the egg, and then it, the mum has the birth, and the baby shark comes out, okay? Inside this group, we have different types. We have lepidotrophic, okay? That would be the case of the angel shark, okay? Where they have, okay, here we have him, um, where the shark has an egg with yolk inside, with all those nutrients, they will absorb those nutrients, and once they've absorbed all those nutrients and they're fully formed, they will come out of the mother. The mother will give birth to these fully developed sharks. Okay, but there's no actual connection to the mum. Okay, they just have this um, yolk. Okay, these nutrients, this like egg sac, where they will feed on until they are fully developed. Then we have another group that are called a matrotrophic. Okay, development. Okay, they're oviviparous. Okay, with eggs and they're matrotrophic. And there's three different matrotrophic um, um, developments. Some use a strategy called ophagy. Okay, this means that when a mum okay is developing young inside, um, what they do is they might have a couple of um, ovules, a couple of eggs, okay, that have been fertilized and will start to develop. But there will be other eggs inside that are not developing. Those eggs that have not developed will be food for those sharks that have been fertilized, for the eggs that have been fertilized and will turn into sharks. And once they are big enough, they will eat those unfertilized sharks, okay? And this would be the case. Um, this was a shark that um, died. They opened up and they found these three ones, developing sharks, okay? And there were all these unfertilized eggs also. So once these sharks were old enough, they would have started to eat these unfertilized eggs to get nutrients, to continue developing, to get strong and be ready to, to live their life as soon as they, they were born. Okay. Um, the histotrophy, okay. Um, this one is that the mum inside creates some sort of food, okay that the babies will depend on, okay, as they are developing inside the mum. 
And then we have another type of development that is crazy. There's the uterine cannibalism, where the mum is um, the different baby sharks developing inside the mum, okay? But those who develop before, okay, or faster, will end up eating their brothers and sisters, okay? It's quite crazy, but that ensures the survival of, um, of at least a couple of the sharks. They will be fully developed as soon as they come out. Um, and then we have in the sharks, okay, in the chondrichthys, sorry, um, yeah, among the chondrichthys, we have placentary viviparity, okay? This is when basically the babies have some connection to a placenta, a sort of placenta inside the mum, okay? So they feed directly from the mum. You can see these baby sharks, hammerheads, for example, have these, this reproduction. I think these are baby hammerheads. Um, and you can see, okay, this they're like umbilical cords that would connect to the placenta. So yeah, we said that Squatina, Squatina, okay, and our ranger sharks, they're lepithotrophic and oviviparous. Here we can see some images, okay, here we see a tiny angel shark that is developing inside its mum, okay, and here we have the yolk sac. It is feeding on as it is developing, okay? So be absorbing. This is like full of nutrients, uh, especially fats. And it will absorb these nutrients as it develops. Here we see um, uh, inch shot, okay? We're doing the autopsy of it. And we can see the necropsy, sorry. And we can see they have two uteruses. And inside these uteruses, we will have the sharks developing. And this image at the bottom, uh, this was from Natalia Perez. Okay, she sent us this picture not long ago. While she was diving, she found this baby. Okay, it was a premature birth, probably, um, because the baby was born and it still had some of its yolk sac attached to it. Okay. So I doubt, or we doubt that this baby shark um, will survive without being fully developed, sadly. But anyway, super interesting photo. Um, so there was a study, okay, where um, we saw that um, sharks, angel sharks can have between seven and 25 pups, okay? give birth between 7 and 25. This will depend on the size and the age of the mother. The gestation periods for angel sharks is between 8 and 10 months. Okay, it's quite a long gestation period. Like most sharks, it's pretty long. And it's one of the reasons why um, sharks are so vulnerable to any sort of impact, especially fishing. And the size when born is between 24 and 30 centimeters, even though we do have some smaller sharks um, recorded uh, during our, our study, our investigations and our field work. Here we have some really interesting images. Um, here we can see the uterus of a pregnant mum, we get a two uterus. And here, Okay, if this is once the uterus was opened up, okay, we can see these big yolk sacs. And we can see tiny little babies starting to develop. Here we have a magnified image of it. And we can see these babies here, okay. They look like tadpoles, they're nothing really, they're just head and tail. Okay? But they're starting to feed on these nutrients and starting to develop. And here we have uh, another angel shark, okay, that was also pregnant, but here we can see, okay, nearly fully formed angel sharks, okay, one here, one here, one here. But we can see that they still aren't completely developed and they still have some of this yolk, okay, attached to them. Okay, so I'm not sure if you can see them properly, here's the mouth fins, another thing here, the gills, 
this one is um, you can see the ventral part of the angel shark while this one and this one is the dorsal parts we're looking at here we can see one eye one eye so we get the back fins here one fin here okay so yeah super interesting images and super interesting um, reproduction definitely so we get to um, the next part of the the chat uh, this talk um, where we're going to emphasize how important uh, scuba divers are and citizen science to our work and therefore for the conservation and protection of angel sharks because over 700 sightings okay where over 1,100 angel sharks and were registered in only the first year. Okay, now this was data that helped to set up all this project. So without um, scuba divers, none of this would have been possible. But that doesn't mean that the work is done. We need, okay, your effort. We need to continue working, okay? Because it said, as I said right at the beginning of the talk, this is a marathon. We need to know more information, okay? And we need to know if these populations are increasing, decreasing, if there's any um, other weird movements of angel sharks, any information, we need to just keep gathering. So we want to take the opportunity to keep um, encouraging everyone to register their sightings on our sightings map. So that's www angelsharkproject.com okay, um, slash map, we have our sightings map where you can go have a look and you can see, uh, you can choose the language you want to look at and you can see, okay, the sightings um, that have already been registered. Now we see that, um, for example, here we have one in Madrid. It probably won't mean Madrid, okay, but it means one along Spain. We don't put the exact place um, where the angel shark was sighted, uh, just to keep it safe, okay, that place. If we said where exactly, okay, those, um, those places might be overcrowded by people going to try and locate those sharks. But anyway, here we have 19 around Italy. Okay, Libya is the place where we're getting sightings recently. Okay, and we might have uh, some sort of collaboration project being set up here. Um, along here, okay, Turkey, Cyprus, uh, New Greece also. But as you can see, in the Canary Islands, okay, we're definitely in the lead. Okay. Um, here we can see the number of angel sharks for each island. Um, Fuerteventura with a huge number of angel sharks. It doesn't mean that in La Palma, La Gomera, um, there aren't angel sharks. It just means that we need to get the, everyone to know about the importance of uploading um, their sightings and registering their sightings on our map. Um, so that's what we all can do, especially us get people involved and some people don't upload their sightings because they think it takes a lot of work but we've tried to make it as simple as possible and as easy as possible okay so once you go to your sightings map okay to this map um if you just press on the map okay you will get a menu a box like this where you can actually point in the map where you saw the angel shark okay we'll take this map and you just click on it um, you put the country, um, have you seen the Inch in Canary Islands, the islands you saw it, um, the date um, when you saw your angel shark, the time more or less, how many angel sharks you saw, do you know the depth, okay, if you have data of the depth, um, then you say what habitat was the angel shark on, was it on a sandy bed, was it swimming on top of rocks? Was the angel shark tagged? We'll see that in a moment. You can upload a file of a photo or a video, I uh, think, or just photo, sorry. So if you have a photo of the shark, you can upload it here. Uh, that would be super useful. 
And here you can leave any other comments. If it was injured, if it had um, mating marks on the pectoral fins, um, any other interesting information goes here. Behavior, for example. Um, the babies, it's not very easy to know if they're male or female. Okay, these are baby sharks while doing our surveys. Well, we have to take them out and uh, do some work on them. And one of the things we do is check see if they're males or females. Now, we said the males have these claspers, the mating organs, okay. But on the babies, these claspers are not very developed yet, okay. Here you can see they have tiny little claspers at the sides, okay. The females do not have these small claspers, okay. Anyway, it's information that's going to be very hard for you to actually see while diving. Okay, so don't worry if you can't see the six of an angel shark, okay, while you're on your dive. Don't annoy it or try to disturb it just to see the six, okay, see so if it's male or female. Um, it's because, first of all, okay, it can be. Um, can be bad for a shark because if the shark is um, lying in a specific place, it's because that place offers, offers it protection or there's a good source of food there or any reason we don't know of, okay? But that's the place it chose to stay. If we make it swim, um, it will go somewhere else that maybe is less suitable for it and it wastes energy doing that. Also, hey, the sharks. <laughs> so, um, they do if they feel attacked or they feel uh, under under pressure. They feel um, yeah that they will attack. Okay, they they're going to defend themselves. Um, they might bite. Um, it's not common though, but hey, we've got to keep um, keep aware of them. Okay, and especially respect them because they are wild animals. As I said before. If you see an angel shark with a tag, okay, Eladio Frias, a photographer that's helped us loads, um, so you're taking loads of photos. But if you see an angel shark like this with one of the tags, okay, it's super important to tell us on the comments or in the, in the boxes we saw before that the angel shark was tagged. And actually on the tag, there is a specific number and each angel shark will have a tag with a specific and unique number. That tells us what angel shark it is. So when we tagged that angel shark for the first time, we recorded where it was, how big it was, um, and all the data we could gather of that moment. So then if that shark is found somewhere else, okay, um, and we know what shark it is, that gives us a great information of the movements of the sharks. In adult sharks, the tag you will find here, second dorsal fin, um, usually under the fin. And on baby sharks, okay, because the tail is still very small, the tags are located here on the pectoral fin, okay. Um, and they also have a code at the side. So, yeah, if you see an angel shark, please register on our map. You can have sightings map, and if it's tagged, please try and read the number of the tag and include, and include it in your registration, and that would be super useful, really. So I hope you're not too bored. <laughs> um, we're reaching the end, okay, of, of this talk about angel sharks, but I don't want to end yet without explaining a couple more things about our work here in the Canary Islands. So one of the projects we, we have currently is this acoustic tagging project in La Graciosa Marine Reserve, okay, at the north of Lanzarote. There's the biggest marine reserve in Europe um, that includes La Graciosa, Alegranza Islands, and a couple of small little islets around here. And here we have uh, a unique project where we have these receptors distributed along the reserve, around the reserve. And we have angel sharks that are tagged with special tags that send out a specific signal. 
This signal, okay, is will be received by the receptor, okay, and um, and recorded. After a year, we go back and we download the data from each receptor, and it gives us super valuable information about how the angel sharks are moving around in this uh, around the, the marine reserve. This project is starting to get bigger. Okay, we're still trying to um, put more receivers and tag more sharks. This year, we managed to collect, um, sorry, end of last year, we managed to collect um, our first data from the receptors. And we're working on that data right now. And it seems quite interesting. Okay, so hopefully soon we'll be able to publish something about this. And in the next weeks, we'll be talking about this on social media. So we also, besides that project, um, the acoustic project, we do outreach and we cooperate with all the users of the marine environments, okay, all the involved actors. Well, that includes recreational fishermen and professional fishermen. As I said, um, us divers, recreational divers, we can only go down to 40, 30 meters maximum. Okay, that's the legal depth for us. So the sightings and the sharks that are under that depth can only be reported by accidental fishermen. Okay, now fishers don't go looking for angel sharks, they know it's legal to catch them and they won't try and catch angel sharks. But sometimes there is accidental um, catches. Um, they all know how to proceed, and once they catch the new shark, they have to put it back in the water as safe as possible. But they will give us also important information, so they're good allies for us. And obviously, with divers, dive centers, clubs, okay, um, super important for us to work with everyone and, and continue with our outreach. Then we have. Um, a brother project, okay, that is actually, uh, currently being carried on in Wales, okay, in the UK. Now, this project um, started because the there were sightings of fishermen, old sightings. So, um, what was uh, Jake, this guy here? He started to um, talk with fishermen, okay, to try and finds historical catches of angel sharks and whales. And while he was doing it, he found out that there were actually quite recent um, catches of angel sharks around whales, but they were just calling angel sharks monkfish or other names. So is with more work, um, they found out that there is where uh, angel sharks right now in Wales and this project is expanding and um, having some really interesting results. And as I said at the beginning, okay, the angel shark project, um, Canary Islands is just part of the angel shark conservation network. What uh, the mission is to gather all these entities that are working with angel sharks. It doesn't have to be just with the Squatina squatina, okay, but with any species of angel sharks. And try to unite to be able to help each other out, gather information, share information, okay. And as I said, it would be great if we could, um, in time, manage to recover the angel shark populations in those places where now they have disappeared. So that would be like uh, a super goal uh, of the end of the line. Um, if you go to the Angel Shark Conservation Network webpage, um, you can go there through angelsharkproject.com. Um, you can find loads of resources. Um, all, our public, all, all of our publications are there for you guys to download um, in different languages, uh, English and Spanish, scientific papers, reports and stuff. Um, all of that is there, and we're usually quite active on social media. So this is the end of the chat. I uh, hope it hasn't been too long okay, or too boring. Um, hope you enjoyed. And now it's time for you guys to ask questions. I guess my